a National Farmers Organization ladies' meeting at the 1980 National Convention in Cincinnati, Ohio. In the manner of the book Merchants of Grain, we normally at this program have more than one speaker, but when I called him and asked him if he would speak for us here, he said, I'm not a professional speaker. What I would like to do is to talk for 30 or 40 minutes and tell them what I'd like to tell them, and then I'd like to open it up to questions and have them ask me what they want to know. So that's the way we'll handle it. Also, I thought it would be good if we could involve some of our newer NFO leaders, and so I have asked Janice Brethauer to introduce our speaker this evening. Janice is an NFO second generation, you'd say. She's grown up in an NFO household in Nebraska. Her folks are the Lynn Brethauers, and they have been good, steady in the harness members for as long as I know. And she has graduated from college in her state, uh, majoring in marketing. She's been working for the last year for the organization. Uh, she assisted with seminars in the Colorado and Nebraska areas, and I've heard that she's been a, a real asset to the organization. So it's with pleasure that I pass along the meeting now to Janice Brethauer. I'm certain that you all recognize this book. We've used this book as a resource text these past months in the organization. Thank you. This book actually reflects the amount of power and the profits of the five giant grain companies, five privately held companies at the heart of the world's food industry. I think it's interesting that the author's investigation into this global trade actually reveals the trading of food commodities for the very first time. And the book tells us about not only the men and, and their personalities and reveals to us that there are seven families that own a large share of these companies, but it also introduces us to the grain business. It gives us some idea what its mysteries are, it gives us an idea of how colorful the business is, and it gives us a great deal of folklore also. I think that, that the book, The Merchants of Grain, actually makes it clear to us just how very, very important grain is as a powerful political tool. We can see how closely the grain company's growth is kind of interwoven to our own growth here in the United States as a grain power. Over the past year, we've had a seminar that has introduced us to uh, several variables that, that actually enlighten us to the fact of wh how powerful grain is to other parts of the world as well as ourselves. We know grain is food or primary energy. We've, we've looked at this in a relationship to actual population growth and how the population growth is not an only factor in this, but we're also looking at how there are greater demands placed on this, kind of a compounding sense. The world's diet is actually changing. People are demanding more red meat in their diets. And we're also seeing another factor that, that is occurring worldwide, and that is that there's a great deal of movement from rural areas to the city urbanization. What is actually taking place is there are fewer of us in rural America actually putting food on the table of larger and larger numbers in the cities. Currently, the author of this book is covering agriculture for the Washington Post. He informed me this evening that his education hasn't stopped with the publication of the book. It's ever continuing. <laughs> Some recent developments, uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Company is doing a one-hour documentary film. It uh, has been filmed in New Orleans, uh, Minneapolis, St. Louis, and also in Europe. It covers Geneva, 
London, Rotterdam, and Paris. This film is due to be released within the next few months, and it primarily uh, is an exploration into the Louis Dreyfus Corporation and Continental Grain. I hope that we'll all be viewing it one of these days soon on PBS broadcasting networks here in the United States. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to the author of The Merchants of Grain, Mr. Dan Morgan. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. You, is this coming through at all? I'm a little taller than Janice. Can you hear me? All right. How's that? Better? Stay real close. Thank you very much, Dorothy, and thank you very much, Janice. I don't know if you haven't left me with very much to say. I've just about covered the subject of my whole book, so um, I can just about tear up the speech. Um, when uh, Dorothy called me a couple of months ago, I had no idea that there was going to be an audience of this size. Uh, and I am very, very happy to see that uh, the NFO is doing so well in terms of their membership and their participation at their conference. Um, Chuck Frazier in Washington, uh, NFO, uh, he raised me since I was knee-high from a grasshopper as a reporter in Washington. Um, I don't know if he's here tonight, but um, Chuck was very helpful to me. Uh, as the NFO Washington representative a couple of years ago when I was uh, beginning my research on this book. It was invaluable to have him there, I must say, egging me on a little bit. I do have a farm background, and I feel that's one reason I'm very, very happy to be here tonight. Uh, my father, uh, I grew up on a dairy farm in the eastern shore of Maryland, and then we moved to upstate New York. And how well I remember my dad saying to me, Sonny, I saw a cow uh, leaning up against that electric fence out there. Would you go out and test it and make sure the current is still on? <laughs> That's when I decided to go into journalism. <laughs> I'd really hope that um, I could report to you right now and let you be, have the first to know who the new Secretary of Agriculture was going to be. Um, I had him cornered in a Washington law firm today, or somebody who I thought might be in line for it. Dick Bell came up from uh, Riceland Foods and um, was having a meeting with the agricultural task force of uh, President Reagan. Um, and I called him twice, um, but he never returned my phone call, so I can only assume that he didn't like my book. Um, but I can report that I did run into Earl Butts a few hours after that. I ran into him at the airport in Washington. And when you find, and he was acting very confident and uh, like he owned the place. Uh, when you find Earl Butts in the Washington airport, you've got to ask yourself some questions about where we're going. My personal feeling is, that brace yourselves, ladies and gentlemen, because big the big agricultural interests are coming to town. I mean Washington. I don't mean just Earl Butts. I mean big grain companies, meat packers, processors, shippers, the big interests. We're already seeing it in the choice of the people they've brought in as their transition team, uh, no question where the emphasis is. And in my view, and I think this is something that you'll all be discussing at your conference here, we're going to see the intensification of the economic struggle in agriculture over the next four years. It's going to be a struggle, a raw, very raw uh, struggle for raw economic power, in my opinion, uh, because the people that I'm afraid will be coming to town will be those who are, in, are in, interested in trade and maximum exports in the processing side of agriculture, in the industrial side of agriculture, 
and that those, those interests are going to take precedence over conserva soil conservation, price stability, the security of small farmers, and the security of our transportation system. And I think that uh, I'm, I'm, very ex I'm, I'm worried but very excited about being in Washington because I think that uh, as a journalist who has an interest in agriculture, we're going to see conflict of a kind we've almost never seen before as this struggle, this intensifying economic struggle uh, continues. It really begins in January. Uh, well, how did we get to this kind of a struggle? I, you know, usually when, uh, when I've heard uh, discussions of the history of American agriculture, it's always been done in terms of the farmer. You know, the farm, the, we had X number of farms in 19, 1860 and X number in 1880 and so forth and so on. So let's just for a second, um, I'd like to take you down uh, the historical path uh, from a little different perspective. Instead of looking at the farmers, let's look at how one of these very large grain companies um, grew through history. Uh, Cargill might be a good example. It's based in Minneapolis and it's right in the heartland. Uh, it started very, very small back in the middle of the uh, 1860s. Uh, uh, just c small country elevators um, on the um, railroad lines that were pushing west. Um, the wheat culture, it was right in the middle of it then. Will Cargill, the founder of that company, uh, built himself some, managed to get uh, connection with, to the Milwaukee bankers, uh, to the Minneapolis uh, grain millers, and of course to the railroads. And through these connections and uh, his own uh, skills as a manager and businessman, he built up the beginnings of Cargill. Uh, by the end of his lifetime, uh, he was hauling, uh, he was buying grain from the farmers and selling the farmers coal, which he'd hauled in from his own boats uh, on, the, um, on the Great Lakes. So uh, Cargill's history after that is, uh, well, it was, it was one of relatively slow growth. Uh, uh, an inland, inland grain company uh, buying and selling grain, involved in some other businesses and that sort of thing, but relatively small. You know, the Europeans, the European grain companies were the real merchants of grain. They'd started in the, with the Industrial Revolution. The farmers, people left the farms at uh, the turn of the 19th century and they came into the, uh, came into the uh, uh, cities uh, in England and they had to be fed. They were away from their food supply, and they turned to these big European grain merchants. But Cargill wasn't really involved in that then. They, they, were, they were more or less in, uh, buying and selling grain in the, uh, in the interior. Uh, and it wasn't really until the, 19, uh, the 1940s and 1950s, that, and even beyond that, that uh, Cargill's growth uh, began. It, uh, it began um, as a result of the grain trade, and it, it Cargill's, uh, you can see its whole structure changing as you follow it down through history. Small farms are getting smaller, uh, are getting larger, fewer farmers. Cargill's getting bigger and more prosperous as the grain exports expand. And in the 1950s and 1960s, it began to move into the processing industry uh, in a very, very big way, into soybeans, into uh, into, into animal feeds and so forth. Um, and as far as I can determine, much of this was financed by, the, by, the, by their grain trading operations, by their uh, ability to take advantage of the food aid, food assistance programs. Um, and what do we have now? We have, from those very, very humble beginnings in the Midwest, in the, eight, in the middle of the 19th century, surely one of the largest privately owned companies in the world and, and, and perhaps the fastest growing enterprise uh, between the Rocky Mountains and the Appalachians. Uh, number one in soybean crushing. Uh, number two in meat packing. Number one in grain exports. Uh, a major factor in the barge trade up and down the Mississippi River. Not only owning barges, owning the towboats that pull the barges. Um, 
a major factor in the animal feeding business with its feedlots in the southwest. It's developing, trying to develop, already has developed uh, hybrid corn seed, uh, working on hybrid wheat, which will put it in a very commanding position should it um, be successful in developing that. Um, it's in, um, so you see it's, it's all uh, very integrated. Uh, I might go on beyond, if you get beyond the shores of this country, you'll find Cargill, um, one of the largest shipping companies in the world. We, we were amazed to find out how, how many ships they had. Uh, um, I think they could probably uh, make Aristotle Onassis um, uh, buy them and sell them. They're, they're very, very substantial in the shipping, in the major open ocean shipping business. Uh, they're in the Philippines. Uh, they, they've got coasters in the Philippines buying and selling copra. So uh, now in Geneva, in their trading operations, don't think it happens in the Chicago Board of Trade, ladies and gentlemen. It happens in Geneva, far away in Switzerland. That is basically uh, the center of Cargill's offshore grain operations. It is for all the grain companies, in fact. Continental has a very large office there. Uh, Bungie is, has, a, uh, has a Swiss operation. Andre, which has, a, has its subsidiary co uh, company here, Garnack, is based in Switzerland. It's an we went there this summer um, to the Trade Axe office in, um, in Geneva, and it's an extraordinarily impressive place. Um, <coughs> it's, um, Trade Axe is, is uh, we talked to the top people there. Uh, Cargill let us in to, to do some filming there for the, for the documentary, which uh, Janice mentioned. And um, first of all, the first thing you see when you go in the door is this very, very large super tanker, which is uh, named after one of the Cargill relatives. Um, then you, uh, you get inside and you hear this language of 100, the first thing you hear is 100,000 tons, you know, somebody's trading. Um, and uh, we talked to the top people, and uh, I, recall, I recall them saying, you know, we, 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 were, we were in touch with the Chinese every day. Uh, and I said, well, do you call the Russians? And he said, well, uh, no, they call us. Um, it gives you, the, it gives you a, a, a really a, a sense of the enormity of the global scope of this, uh, of this whole trading operation. And let's face it, this is who farmers sell their grain to, uh, they sell their livestock to, and they're buying their seeds from. Now, to think that uh, the size of Cargill and the, and the growth of the, the large international trading companies is, is uh, irrelevant to farmers or makes no difference seems to me rather naive because uh, what Cargill, Continental, Pillsbury, PV, and these other companies do is a form of national planning over which, we, over which farmers themselves have very little control. Well, it's fine if Cargill uh, uh, builds a sunflower plant in North Dakota and you, you're looking for a market, you happen to be up there, living up there, and looking for a market for sunflowers. You can uh, praise Cargill. But what if you're on one of those little railroad spurs that Cargill doesn't want to serve anymore because um, it's setting up a unit train route to, to uh, the west coast or down to the gulf. Where are you then? It seems to me that there is there's a real trade-off. In a sense, there is a, these companies are providing the market. They are, uh, they are discovering new markets abroad and, and helping find new markets. Now, let there be no mistake about it. They're also in a powerful position, able to plan changes in the transportation structure of this country. They are doing that. They're doing it in their own corporate boardrooms. You can say that um, when you look at Cargill's growth or Bungie or Continental, uh, you realize that these have been very good years for agribusiness this last, this last decade. Uh, it is amazing. I was you know, on the tr also on the plane coming out today. They served something on the in the snack called apple munchies, manufactured by the Vacuum Dry Company of Emeryville, California. And it said on the label, 
contains less than 2% of the U.S. <clears throat> daily requirement of protein, vitamin A, riboflavin, calcium, and iron. I wondered why I was eating it. It had been vacuum dried and puffed. And I wondered how much energy and oil had gone into that. And I wondered what the price of it was. And I wondered what a crazy agricultural and food system we have in this country. <laughs> it hasn't really benefited, it seems to me, um, when you look at this enormous agricultural bounty of this country. Of this country um, the last 10 years really hasn't benefited farmers and consumers that much. Um, yeah, it's paid, for, it's paid for some of the foreign oil. But what about the food prices, which the Department of Agriculture now predicts will go up between 10 and 15 percent in 1981? We have been rationing beef. The amount of beef in the supermarket in Washington, in the supermarket counter, you can see it, almost see it declining as the, as the consumer resists the beef resist those higher prices for steak. You can, see the, you can see the changes taking place overnight. We are changing our diet as a result of uh, this massive export trade. We are the ones that are really rationing grain in this country so we can export more. The feed grain trade, I notice, uh, just in the, last, uh, in the last decade, has been averaging a growth of 12 percent a year in the 1970s. That's compared to a growth of only 8 percent for the wheat trade. So it certainly, it seems to me, has not benefited uh, the consumer back east. Now, I'm, I get accused uh, by my friends of uh, being, a, being a lobbyist for the, uh, for the farm interests because I, I also tell them, I said, look, the, I don't think you can, there's any way you can argue that the farmer is getting a fair return for his grain or his produce. When you look at the, at the, at the current, all right, so the, the corn and wheat prices are pretty high right now compared to what they've been, but the economists tell me, tell me that these prices are really 20 percent lower in real terms than they were in 1973. That's a figure that comes from John Schnitger, he's an agricultural consultant in Washington. He's, he didn't make it up. He ran it through his econome econometric uh, computers and so on and came up with that figure. How long can we really go on getting the same, getting pre-OPEC prices in a post-OPEC world? Our food exports are growing. There's no question about that. This is good in some respects, but it's not all good for the reasons I've mentioned. And the problem is that it's a lot like oil in, that, uh, in, the, in, the late, in the late 1960s in the Persian Gulf, which was, <coughs> as you know, Gulf oil in the, in the 1960s was very much under the control of the multinational oil companies. That was before the OPEC governments got into the act. In the grain business today, it's remarkably similar. There are a lot of comparisons between oil and grain, and I think that uh, I think there's going to be a lot more of these comparisons made in the next few years. But one of the comparisons is that, unlike the uh, like OPEC and the like the OPEC countries, the uh, the Persian Gulf countries in the latter part of the 1960s, it is the private companies which are very much in control of the system, multinational grain companies, except for Cargill and, and except for Texaco and Exxon and uh, uh, Shell, Reed, Cargill and Continental and Bungie. Now, I don't think that, you know, I, th I think that um, the, talk about a, a, the talk about a grain cartel, uh, which we've heard a lot of lately, I don't think there's too much political support. There's not too much political support in Washington for using food as a political weapon. I'm not sure that um, 
This country, with its humanitarian traditions, likes the idea very much. And I don't think that currently there is too much support in Congress for that, political support. But it seems to me there is support for justice, for, for, America, for the American economic system. I don't want to sound like a, like a nationalist or a chauvinist, but it seems to me we're going to have to have a new kind of grain trading system over the next decade, one in which will involve some kind of agreements that stabilize prices, that guarantee a fair price to farmers, protect our livestock industry, and the environment. This is not a weapon, it seems to me. It's a, it's a matter of national self-interest and self-defense. Because what's happened? What's happened to, the, uh, to our farms in the 1970s? We have seen problems with soil erosion, tremendous amount of land that has been brought into production um, because of the price uh, is very fragile and delicate. Personally, I would be very concerned about the, the long-range impact of that. I'm concerned about the long-range impact of the central pivot irrigation systems um, in western Nebraska. I'm concerned about the water which we're taking out of the aquifer in the western wheat belt. That water is not going to be put back. And I'm certainly very concerned about the effect of these huge grain exports on inflation at home. We don't have any protection from, from, the, uh, from the system, from the massive exports at this point. So it seems to me for economic, environmental, and human terms, we need to uh, create some kind of a new system. And I, I'm, not, I'm not here to propose one. But there has got to be some alteration of what we have now. The, um, I mentioned land earlier, but we don't have an unlimited supply of land in this country. Uh, I read an article just very recently about the amount of land that's uh, being taken out of production uh, for citrus crops in Florida. This is going on not just in Florida. It's going on all over the United States. I don't think that there is, and I, another point, I mean, people think that these grain exports come uh, without, without strain on the transportation system. But if you've been on the Mississippi River lately, if you've been to Lock and Dam 26, where the delays are up to two to three days, where the barges are backed up way back, uh, four or five miles around the bend, um, and where you read that the there is going to have to be a new, uh, a new lock built there where the rivers have to be kept uh, maintained and dredged uh, at a cost to the U.S. taxpayer, at a growing cost. Now, I raise the question whether, whether the grain trade, given these realities, is too important to be left to the grain companies. Now, I've heard all the old free market arguments about um, about why a free market is a good thing. And certainly, in the best of all worlds, a free market is the best thing. But I want to know, and one of the arguments, of course, is that others will produce more. If we, if we interrupt our grain supply or, or try to stabilize our grain exports, if we try to have some kind of share, public share of the uh, uh, public say in the uh, export of grain, that uh, supersedes that of the private companies, that foreign company countries will just get it somewhere else. But I'd like to know where they're going to get it. The Russians have been trying for the last 20 years. They've been pouring money into, into, the, into their agriculture. They haven't been neglecting agriculture. Yet they still need to come into the world market for some 35 million tons of grain a year. And they still can't feed their people adequately. Tropical agriculture, we've heard about how the rich tropics are going to produce the, uh, the big payoffs, but that hasn't happened either. We've heard, too, that grain arrangements, such as the kind we've worked out with the Chinese um, or with the Soviet Union or Mexico, that these historically don't work. 
But I think that my guess is that we're in a somewhat different period in our history right now, that uh, we're in a period where it's a seller's market, where we exercise a great deal more leverage than we did in the period of the 1960s and 1950s when there was a grain surplus. I know that we started late, so I'm going to perhaps end a little early tonight. Um, I tell you that I, I really do care about um, what happens in American agriculture. I'm, I, um, I grew up on a dairy farm in, in the eastern shore of Maryland, which was in the 1940s, and we raised hogs, had some dairy cows, some poultry, and uh, my old man used to take me out on a horseback uh, ride along the the hedgerows uh, that divided the fields. There were lots of, I, I have a memory of a lot of people and a lot of animals. And, um, well, we, we went back there, uh, a few of us, uh, a couple of years ago, and we didn't recognize the place. It was absolutely unrecognizable. The hedgerows were gone. They'd been knocked down to create new fields. The, the, uh, the people were gone. There were, there was, it seemed like there was no people there. And certainly there was no animals. The farm was, was, had been turned into a giant wheat farm on the eastern shore of Maryland. Frankly, I never even knew they grew wheat there. But maybe you can, you know, maybe, maybe we were wrong to feel nostalgic and sad for our, for our family farm and what had happened to it. Um, for the house that was just standing there in the middle of a wheat field. But um, I personally am, am concerned about the future. And I'm concerned about what happens when the whole United States looks like that. When the whole United States is growing specialty crops that serve, that, that feed into a vast global marketing system and over which the farmer has very little control. Once that grain is delivered at the country elevator and is sold and he takes his money, let, no, let there be no mistake about it, the grain is then beyond the farmer's control. It's moved into a, a global marketing system. And it has come under the domain of the large grain companies, the processors, agribusiness, and so on. It seems to me that that is going to be the fight in the 1980s, the fight over the control of that grain, who is going to establish the price. I realize that weather and politics and things that beyond anybody's control, that those things have a tremendous impact on the price and there's not too much we can do about it. Yet I also believe that this country and the, the farmers of this country, through, through their efforts, can have more say in the in, this, um, in the marketing of this grain, understanding the system, trying to see how it works, how it might work best for them. I wish you all well on that project. Thank you very much. I guess we'll be moving this up and down. Huh? Okay. We have that microphone back there. Would somebody see if it's working now? We would like to open up the meeting to questions that you might have that you would like to direct to Mr. Morgan. And uh, those of you who have read the book may have some questions about that. And also, since he is in Washington, D.C. as an active reporter, uh, there may be a few things that you might like to ask him uh, regarding current situations, but I would hope that you'd stay mostly with the topic that he was here discussing with us tonight. Uh, he's only given us the tip of the iceberg. His book has been considered valuable enough that it's being translated into other languages, French, Japanese, Spanish, Portuguese. Portuguese, just found out today. Uh, so this information that we have been privileged to have a crack at very early from 
it's being made available. Uh, we were using his information through the grain seminars this past winter, and we'll be using more of it in his, his updated material this coming year. Uh, it's valuable to us as producers. He just happens to be the author. Uh, would somebody test that microphone back there and see if it's working, please? Okay. Those of you who would have questions, if you would be kind enough to step over to the microphone so that everybody can hear the question as well as the answer. <clears throat> oh, I see an old friend back there. My friend and yours, Mr. Staley. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay, would you like to start? I think the you're going to see a, we're going to see a lot. My guess is we're going to see a great deal more of this, of of foreign companies and countries coming in and buying upstream. You know, we had a fascinating experience talking. We for the television show, uh, the documentary, we talked to a Japanese cooperative in New York City, and I asked the question, hypothetical question: What happens if tonight? The U.S. were to cut off all foreign grain exports, and he he turned uh, he really turned quite pale and began to get very nervous, and he said there would be chaos in my country, panic. It happened in 1973 with the soybean embargo, and the result has been that they're afraid that uh, at some point the U.S. government is going to say. Uh, only U.S.-based companies, in a, in, a, in, a, in a situation of very tight supplies, only U.S. companies are going to be permitted to export grain for a certain period of time. The Japanese want to be in a position where they have access to a supply. Um, you know, in, in a sense, it's, uh, it's part of the whole importance of North America, the gro growing importance of North America in the last 15 years as a great grain power. Um, it's not only, not only them, the Germans have bought farmland and, and some inland elevators, I understand. Um, and I think, it's being, I think the concern is being driven by this fear of what the U.S. government will do. Right now, we don't have a grain policy in the United States. It's, it's a uh, it's a catch-as-catch-can operation. It means that the U.S. US government decides uh, uh, on the basis of the current situation what to do in the grain markets. It has other countries very uneasy. And at some point, as I said earlier, I'm, I believe that the U.S. government is going to have to bite the bullet and work out some kind of a grain policy for the 1980s, which will prevent this kind of panic reaction uh, from, from uh, countries abroad. Does that uh, go uh, answer your question at all? Can you hear me? I'd say it was all in the family, if you ask me. Um, these, these, uh, these Japanese co uh, companies, of course, uh, you know, we're talking about Marabini, uh, Mitsui, um, Mitsubishi, but particularly Mitsui, I believe, has also uh, gotten involved in the, the West Coast business too, in Portland, elevators in Portland. Uh, but these are giant, uh, these are huge, giant uh, companies, you know, much the same as, uh, as the large uh, grain multinationals. They, they do a lot of business together. The Japanese companies um, have arrangements, have uh, contractual arrangements with some of the grain companies. 
They buy and they buy and sell. Uh, they have throughput operations in in, uh, in port terminals, um, arrangements, uh, contracts of that sort. Uh, so I, I don't see it as uh, I don't see these as competitors so much as I do uh, just uh, part of the same club. Do we have another question? Who uh, could you? Who are these? Uh, who owns these silos? These, this, who owns the storage? Well, it's, this is one of the problems. It's very hard to. I went down the went down the Mississippi River once, trying to find out the ownership of some of the uh, grain terminals on the river. These crucial river river terminals, and I had the same problem you you're having. Who owns them? Who who uh, controls them? The fact is that um, there are there are, they use uh, in some cases they use local business interests to stand in for them. They use um, uh, local banks in some cases. Maybe they're foreign interests. Maybe these are a, maybe it's a, a company in the based in the Bahamas. Uh, I've seen cases like that too. There's there's no way under the system we have right now of of getting to the root of ownership of some of those um, uh, installations. Well, I, in my opinion, it hurt the grain farmers unnecessarily because by the way it was administered. It's another example of what happens when Washington doesn't know what it's doing. It, I, I, personally, I personally feel that the grain embargo could have been carried out very effectively, um, and it would not have been necessary to see prices plunge for six or eight weeks the way they did. Um, but I'm reminded of... Uh, that famous quotation from Socrates. He said, he asked a young man uh, who was aspiring to be a politician. He was standing next to him in Athens one day and he said, uh, you want to be a politician, let me ask you a question. How many people, he, looked, he pointed out at the city of Athens, how much wheat will it take to feed all the people in those houses? And the man, didn't, man said he didn't know. And Socrates said, no man is a statesman who is ignorant of the problems of wheat. This was an example of lack of statesmanship. They really didn't understand in Washington, I don't think the White House understood, what would happen when um, they cut across those contracts. They had to have the banks and the grain companies come in and be bailed out, and I think justifiably under the circumstances, um, when it could have been handled in a in a, in a far more efficient manner um, if there had been some preparation. So I, I, don't, um, I don't personally, th I, I think it did hurt the farmer in the short run. I think in the long run, oddly enough, if there had not been that partial embargo, we might have seen embargoes later on in the summer because of the poor crop in this country. We would have been facing a lot more embargoes. Um, 
That's what I mean about the, the lack of um, consistency, the, the, the sudden, the, the, the unexpected quality of the decision-making in Washington. No one knows what the grain policy is because it's decided from one week to the next. 